So an issue I kind of want to cover in Matthew 7, beginning at verse 15 is what we're going to look at. Uh, I'll just read it through and then we'll, uh, we'll uh, go back through it. So I'll read uh, a few verses, beginning at verse 15. The Lord Jesus Christ says these words, and this is the, the conclusion of his Sermon on the Mount. He says, Beware of false prophets, of the false prophets, excuse me, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. And many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons? And in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Let's pray that the Lord would open our eyes to understand His word. Father, enlighten us by Your Spirit to understand the truth of Scripture. Father, I pray that we would be sanctified, we would be grown in grace, we would draw near to You as we saw this morning in our Sunday school lesson, that we would be abiding in the, shelter, or in, in the shadow of the Almighty. And Father, I pray that if anyone who hears this is unconverted, Lord, that You would bring them to faith in Christ. Perhaps they are one of these people who might stand before you and say, Lord, Lord, but they truly do not know you, Father. I pray you convict them and bring them to faith in Christ this very day, Father. And we glorify you for this teaching that the Lord Jesus gave us. His teaching is so potent and so powerful and so truthful. So we, we praise you for the one who is the truth, the way, the life, our Lord and our King. And we come to you through him. It's in his name we pray. The title is True and False Christianity. True and False Christianity. If, if I could cover a subject, probably, let's say if I, if I was invited to preach in every church in Lawrence County, I would probably preach this, this text every single church. Because every church needs to have this text preached. And this, not only just this text, but this message that there are true and false Christians. There are born again people, and there are people who say they're born again, but they're not. There are pseudo-Christians. In fact, there are many people sitting in pews today in Lawrence County, in South Carolina, in the United States, in the world, who are unconverted. There are deacons who are in churches in the Southern Baptist Convention who are unconverted. There are pastors, dare I say, that are unconverted. This is a fact. From our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a, it's a sober reality. In fact this is probably. The most terrifying text in all of scripture. No verse in all of the Bible. Has brought more fear and more terror upon me. And upon my ministry. Than this passage. Because it is so scary. If you think about it. See pagans. When they die and they stand before God. They know they're not right with God. They live their lives in rebellion to God. They know that. Well, if the God of Scripture is true, then I'm going to hell. They know that. But a self-deceived, false convert, someone who says they're a follower of Christ, but they've, they've never truly known Him, and they've just simply deceived themselves, is truly in the most dangerous position. For they think themselves that I, they can live through this life, and they can do whatever they want, and they will go to heaven when they die. And then they hit that reality. And they would hear the words, I never knew you depart from me. And the reason also I want to address this is because that you, even as genuine Christians, need to understand this and need to, to share this with others. So many Christians I've encountered don't understand this concept. And it brings them a lot of trouble in their lives as believers. And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean they have unconverted family members, siblings, uh, children. Perhaps even a spouse. I've seen it time and time again. And they'll say, well, I mean, I think they're a Christian. They, they say they're a Christian, so I mean, I believe they're saved. And I believe that they're a believer. But they're ignorant of the fact that Jesus said, a true Christian walks as a true Christian would walk. And 
And they bring upon themselves much pain because they think these people are saved. And so they don't, they don't ever warn them about the reality that you could be a false convert. You could be self-deceived. And therefore, those family members and friends that they have could one day perish in their sins and never be warned. They never think the necessity of warning. And not only do I see it in Christians, but also I see it time and time again on the streets. Everywhere. I see it at the rest area. I see it at the abortion clinic. It is all over the place. Especially here in the Bible Belt. I mean, we are just saturated with Christianity here. Well, so we think. Christian lingo. Christian terminology. Christian looking buildings, even. And so I see it time and time again. People, even just a couple weeks ago, I had a conversation with a young couple on the street. Both claimed to be Christians. And they were both drunk as they were talking to me. No, no knowledge of gospel. No knowledge of biblical things. No knowledge of scripture. They couldn't articulate really anything spiritually at all. They even got their answers to me pretty messed up. I asked them, very simply, are you, what are you trusting in to get to heaven? And they answered themselves, trusting their own performance. There is so much self-deception in our world. See, I'm not talking really about the pagan world. I'm not talking about the Muslims or even Roman Catholicism or the Jehovah's Witnesses or, or the Mormons. I'm talking about those who would come under the umbrella of what's called evangelicalism. I'm talking about Southern Baptists. Because I've experienced this myself. I was a false convert for years, about eight years I said the prayer when I was seven years old. I asked Jesus into my heart, quote and unquote. But I lived those next years, next eight years of my life in rampant sin. I never read scripture. I never cared to study scripture. I didn't care about praying. I didn't care about the things of God. Addicted to pornography, drunkenness, partying, worldly behavior, vile language or blaspheme all the time. The list goes on and on. And here's the thing, but here, here's the most terrifying thing, is in the midst of all that, in the middle of all that, I was 100% confident that I was a Christian. 100%. I had no doubts about my salvation. I had no doubts that I was right with God, because I believed, right? I mean, that's what Jesus says. He believes, has eternal life. He believes, is, is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already. He said, I'm the bread of life. He believes in me and will live even if he dies. So I, I thought, well, I, I believe. Therefore, I'm saved, right? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. See, here's what we have to understand. And we'll, we'll see this when we go through this passage. Salvation is totally 100% of grace. Salvation is the free gift of God. But the result of of salvation is work. Work is not the cause, but the result. That is so imperative, so important we understand that. It's imperative to our, our understanding of salvation. Salvation is in no way caused by your work or anyone else's, but when someone is saved, when someone is born again, they live a new life. That's why the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. We have a new nature about us. Brethren, think back to your own conversion. Think back to when, before you were a believer, how you lived, and then think now, how you live. Are we not changed? Are we not different? Why? Why is that? Because we are saved. And people who say they're saved, and they're not changed, and they're not different, and they're in no way different than the rest of the world, or even the Christians, quote and unquote, who are surrounding them, they're not saved. They're not converted. They're self-deluded. They're deceived. And sadly, by pastors, a lot of them, who preach a man-centered gospel. And even, there's a sense in which the scriptures talk about salvation being difficult and hard. See, salvation is a free gift, but being saved costs you something. You've got you to understand that distinction. Scripture says salvation is totally free, and it is, it is free grace for saved by. But being saved, being a Christian, will cost you your life. That's why Jesus comes in Matthew, or excuse me, in Luke 9, as I said earlier, and he calls us, he says, if you want to save your life, you've got to lose it. If you want to come after me, you have to deny yourself daily and take up your cross and come after me. And in Jesus' day, that meant 
And that, that creates so much significance because if a, if a criminal was condemned by the Roman court in Jesus' day, they were led off to the place of execution by carrying their cross. We see this in the Gospels. When Jesus is allowed to be crucified in Golgotha, he carries his cross through Jerusalem. They did that with all criminals who were to be executed. They would beat them and then they would make them carry the cross for shame, public shame, to the place of execution. And he says, if you want to be a follower of Christ, you've got to do the same thing. You've got to let go of your life, let go of your desires, let go of your dreams, let go of your feelings, let go of yourself, deny yourself. There's almost a sense in which there's a self-abasement. There's a self-hatred. We're, we loathe ourselves. We're, in, we're sick of ourselves. And we deny self. And we walk the walk of shame when we come after Christ. That is salvation. It sounds a lot different than what you hear in evangelical churches, right? The pastors will try to woo someone down the aisle and say, well, it'll just take you five minutes. Jesus is just waiting. And that's part of it. Part of it. It's partly free, absolutely. It's a free gift of grace. But having that, being a possessor of eternal life, your life is now gone. In fact, that's exactly what the Apostle Paul says in, in Galatians 2, when he says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ in me. A genuine Christian is dead to sin, or dead to it. So, brethren, we need to understand this. It's so important, so important. Especially as we deal with our own family members. I feel like all of us probably have falsely converted family members. I think that's just something that almost every believer sees. Because especially with the culture we live in. It would be a little different if we were in some Muslim uh, country, you know, where no one really claims Christ. But here in the United States, it's so easy to claim a Christian. Everyone does. Everyone claims to be a Christian. I mean, you, you, you hardly run into someone who's an atheist or an agnostic or any other religion, really. It's mostly Christianity. In fact, we have over a thousand churches in Greenville County. That's a lot. That's a lot of churches. I think it's about 1,200 to be exact. About 1,200 churches uh, in Greenville County. That is astounding. And yet, you see a lot of wickedness down there. It's, just, it, it's because so much false conversion is all over the place. But we need to be discerning so that we can warn family members, we can warn friends, we can warn co workers to be sure that they're converted. To be sure that they are genuinely followers of Christ. And so we'll do that by seeing this passage of Scripture unfolded before us. But before we do, I just want to note, as I, as I always like to do, so important with Scripture interpretation, we understand our context. What is Jesus, what, what, what surrounds his verse? This is the ending of Jesus' greatest sermon, the greatest sermon of all Scripture, the Sermon on the Mount. It spans three chapters, starts in Matthew 5, Matthew 6, and then ends in Matthew 7. It is the last words of the Sermon on the Mount. It is the conclusion. Whenever you are preaching, or whenever, if you write a book or you're writing a paper, at the end you're going to give your conclusion, which is basically a mini presentation of everything you said. It is, a, it, is a, it is what you want to leave the reader off with. In fact, uh, we know from, um, from studies and just from common sense that whenever you listen to a sermon or you read a book, the last thing you remember is the last thing you read. It's the freshest upon your mind. It's like, it's like the top layer. It's like, it's, when you think about that, it's the first thing you think about. And so Jesus knows this. He comes at the end of the sermon and he wants to leave something fresh in his disciples' minds. And it's that some of them aren't disciples. Some of his disciples are not disciples. Truly. That's a hard truth. That's very hard. It's very offensive. It's very challenging. It makes you uncomfortable. But it's true. Jesus told the truth. The man of truth. So he comes here and he says, true Christians bear fruit. True Christians bear fruit. In fact, if you look with me in verse 13, listen to this. This, this is the, the preface, the preface to what he says in verses 15 through 23. He says in verse 17, Enter, now this is an imperative, here's a command. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. He's saying there is a there's a narrow road to salvation. But here's where, here's where the meaning of this of these two verses becomes even more profound. Who is his audience he's speaking to? It's his followers. It's his followers. Turn with him to Matthew 5 1. 
Uh, uh, verse 1 of Matthew 5, what, is, what does it say? When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, who came to him? What's the text say? His disciples came to him. It's his disciples. He's preaching to those who say they are followers of the teaching of Jesus Christ. And so he is saying in verse 13, Among you who claim to be my followers, you need to be sure you're entering through the narrow gate. Because among you, there is a way that is broad and it leads to destruction. He's saying most people who identify as Christians aren't Christians and they're on the road to destruction. That is astounding. Absolutely astounding, brethren. So that is the preface to these, these next few verses. Beginning in verse 15, he says, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. In other words, false teachers. That's a type of a, of a false Christian. Someone is a false teacher. And notice the way he describes them. They come to you in sheep's clothing. We use that phrase all the time. Someone's in sheep's clothing. They're a wolf in sheep's clothing. That's where this comes from. Right here. He says, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. They're unconverted in their heart. Verse 16, you will know. Now listen to this. This is the most important part of this whole message. This whole text of scripture. You will know them by their fruits. And if you actually look down at verse 20, he says the exact same thing. Almost to a T. He says, so that you will know them by their fruits. In Hebrew literature, they did not have exclamation points. In Hebrew literature, they didn't have bold. In Hebrew literature, they did not have underline. They didn't have any of that. They didn't have italics. So how in literature did they stress a point that they wanted to convey? In English, you may use one of those things. You may use bold. You may use italics. You may use underline. You may use an exclamation point. But in Hebrew literature, they would just say it over and over. They would just repeat their point to get it across. They would use repetitive and so look at what he does in verse 16. He says, you'll know them by the fruits. Verse 20, you will know them by the fruits. The two bookends to what he says here. You're going to know my followers by the way they live. That's true. And we know that. Even the secular world recognizes that. The old phrase, actions speak louder than words. It's true. It's so true. All truth is God's truth, my friends. It's true. I mean, if I was, let's, you know, let's just use an example. If I, if I was married, and I, I told my wife, I said, I love you, and went around town, and I was committing adultery with women all around Lawrence County, I would not love her. I'd be a liar. I'd be a liar. The most vile of liars. And yet, we see person after person after person have some emotional experience at church, and say they're a Christian and claim to be a believer, and they don't even show up in church anymore. They don't ever read scripture, they don't ever pray. A lot of them back into drunkenness, worldliness, selfishness. They don't care anything about the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're really lukewarm. They have no passion, no zeal for the things of God. And yet, we'll say, well, once they always saved. How about you were never saved in the first place? I'm all for affirming that precious doctrine of, of eternal security. Of the perseverance of the saints. One saint always saying, that's true. But for genuine Christians, for genuine fruit bearers, not just someone who just says they're Christian. Herein lies probably one of the, I would say, the most damning heresy right now in the church, hands down. Any other heresy goes under this one in terms of dangerousness, in terms of damning. And I say damning because people are all the time going to hell because of this. Because pastors who really should have been reading the Bible more, preachers, evangelists, just in droves tell people, come on, come on, pray, and get saved. And you're always going to be saved. You'll always be saved. And then I never mention this. To be saved, you've got to deny yourself and take up your cross daily. And if you're genuinely converted, if you genuinely come to Christ, your life will change. And if your life never changed, then what you got here was false. What you got here was an emotional experience, and it was never truly legitimate. You don't ever hear that. I say that all the time on the streets. I say, folks... If you confess Christ and you don't live according to what Jesus said, you were never saved in the first place. It's not that you haven't earned your salvation good enough, that you haven't performed well enough to be saved yet. It's that you were never saved in the first place. It's not where we work to be saved. It's we work because we've been saved. Not the cause, but the effect. 
And then he, he asks the question in verse 16. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? That's a rhetorical question. Of course not. No, they don't. And he's saying, okay, so then, it, it, if, and then he's going to answer, well, I, I, I won't say it because he'll, he says it himself in verse 17. He says, so every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. What he's saying is this. You know the quality of the tree by the fruit it produces. If I go out into my, my front yard, a tiny little front yard there, we, we, we planted a big tree, apple tree. And it produced just the most rotten, disgusting apples. They were nasty. And that's all it ever produced. Never did it produce delicious uh, apples, you know, healthy ones, you know, lots of nutrients, but just nasty, rotten. It was like it was a defected tree. I'm going to cut that thing down. I'm going to burn it. I hate that tree, you know. But, but if, if I plant a tree in our front yard and, it, and it's an apple tree and it produces just the most delicious apples, then I know the, treats, the tree is good. It's not a defective tree. So too it is with anyone who claims to be a follower of Christ. We know the quality of their life. We know the, we know the or I should say, we know the, 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 the place that they're in before God by the way they live. In fact, Jesus put it this way. He said, out of the outflow of, or out of the mouth comes the outflow of the heart. In other words, you can tell a lot by also some, the way someone talks. The things that someone says, because that's what's coming out of their heart. Let all who name the name of Jesus Christ depart from evil. I'm astounded that, that this has to be said oftentimes in churches. I thought Christians would be more discerning. That's one of the things that it really blew my mind. Like right after I got saved, I remember just like looking around at other people who claim to be Christians. A lot of friends who I had, you know, doing my sinful uh, masquerades with before I was converted. And just looking at them, looking at their lives, looking at their actions, and just being mind blown that no Christian that I knew had ever just approached him and said, "Are you are you a genuine Christian? I mean, look look at your life, look at the way you live. How, how can you say you're a Christian?" I was astounded that no one had ever said anything. And I began studying, and I'm like, "This is all over Scripture. It's like it's just been overlooked. It's because it's offensive and it's hard. And this is not." How you get numbers. This is not how you grow numerically. In fact, uh, Jesus in John 6, which we went through a couple weeks ago, remember when we went through John 6, and Jesus taught some really offensive stuff. I mean, really offensive. He talks about you can't come to salvation by yourself. God has to cause you to do it. All this stuff. And it says at the end of that chapter that many of his disciples left and were not walking with him anymore. That's not how you grow. That's not how you grow. In fact, uh, I read yesterday uh, a man named Andy Stanley. He's the son of Charles Stanley. The kind of a, a famous uh, preacher and has a big ministry and everything. Well, his son Andy Stanley has gone way off the rocker. Uh, you know, Charles Stanley is much more in the realm of orthodoxy, and, and um, Andy Stanley's way out there. He's, he's he's got a huge church down in Georgia, but um, he has he has said things like uh, he's trashed local churches. He says, I don't know why you're going to a local church. You need to go to a mega church. He says you're being selfish if you go to a, a community, a, a country church, any of that. You're being selfish. Uh, he, uh, he said some pretty weird stuff. One of the things he said, he said, pastors who preach verse by verse through the Bible are just lazy. He, he said it's a, it's a lazy thing to do. It's a, he said it's not the way you preach. He said that's not how you grow people. Well, I could insert a word that I would say, uh, no, no. It's, he is saying that's not how you grow in numbers of people. If you were to be relevant, you shouldn't preach word, by, uh, word for word through a book of the Bible because there are things offensive there. You know, like we're going through Ephesians now. We're, we're dealing with some pretty heavy stuff there in chapter 1 already about unconditional election. About how God is the one who is sovereign in salvation. And God chooses and God elects and God ordains those whom he wills to be converted. That's some heavy truth. That's some heavy reality. That is some pride-crushing truth. That's what I love about God's word. It is just like a pride grinder. It just destroys men's pride. Throws it, uh, throws it down and exalts the glory of God. In fact, that's... I kind of have one of the purposes I, I, I preach, and, and every pastor should be, is for two reasons. One, one, of, the, one of the things that you preach for is to abase, uh, to, to put down the pride of men, to exalt the grace of God. That's what preachers should be doing. And so when you preach first, verse through the Bible, you start to see these, these heavy truths that crush men's pride and exalt God's grace. And this is one of them. 
This just puts men's pride down and exalts, uh, exalts the Lord God. But someone like Hanley Stanley, who says that, uh, is just very ignorant of church history, very ignorant of how you actually do preach. That is how you preach the Bible. God wrote His Word to us in books. He wrote His Word in a linear fashion. When you jump around all over the place, you're not getting the whole message. You see that? I mean, that's like, for example, let's say your spouse, let's say, you know, those of you who are married in here, it would be easy for you to relate. You know, let's say you're, you're separated for, from your spouse for a few weeks, or even a few months, uh, from some horrible circumstance. And they send you letters. And uh, they send you a big collection of, like, 15 letters in a, in a little book. And you just kind of read, you know, you just kind of read selections here and there, and you just try to interpret the selection. You want to get the message with you. Or what they even were trying to say. But if you begin at the beginning and you start reading and you read their argument and you read what they're saying, you don't understand what they're saying. And same way with God. When we go through a verse-by-verse -verse exposition of a book, we are getting what the author intended to say. There's nothing wrong with, like, okay, they hear a selected portion. There's nothing wrong with that. But the best, the best way to preach, verse-by-verse. -verse. And so him to, for him to say that is just pretty astounding. And so now his preaching suffers because he's not giving his people the, the, the whole argument of the book and what the author's saying. And clearly not. He came out and, and basically affirmed homosexuality anyways. So he's way out of the realm of orthodoxy. He's what we would call heterodox, which basically is two words put together. Hetero is actually where we get the word heterosexual, and it's the opposite. You know, you, you like the opposite sex, and you're heterosexual. If you're homo, you like the same. So hetero means you're, you're opposite. You're opposite what? Doxy. You're opposite the teaching of the church. You're heterodox. So he is a heterodox at this point. And we never want to be heterodox. We want to be orthodox, which is in order. We want to be in order with the teaching of Scripture and the church throughout history. That's the thing. There's nothing new. I, I know I'm going a little off, but I want to say this. There's nothing new. No new truth coming out. God has had people. Think about this. He's had his people. His elect studying this for thousands of years. This word, there's nothing new, there's no new insight. Men, men of God and women of God have found the truth. They have searched out the scriptures. If we say, well, I found something new, and no one's ever talked about it in church history, it's a lie. Because God has always been leading his elect to his truth. And that's why we are orthodox. We are according to the, like we, we talked about earlier, the Baptist tradition. I talked about the Reformed tradition. I say tradition not because I get my authority from the tradition, but I confirm when I read the scripture by the tradition. So I, I like, for example, here in Matthew 7. So I, I understand, okay, if you're a true Christian, you bear fruit. If you're not, you won't. Okay, that's a teaching Bible. And then I go to church history, and I see that men like Charles Spurgeon, George Whitfield, Martin Luther, John Calvin, way earlier, Augustine, early church fathers, they all affirmed it. They all said the same thing. So then I go, this is true. This is the true interpretation. All of God's people have always agreed on this. See, that's orthodoxy. That's why church history is very important that we consult church history. So someone like Anne Stanley comes out and says, well, preaching verse by verse, that's just ridiculous. You go to church history, and that's not to be found. The only people who said it were the heretics. <laughs> so that definitely, you then know you're on the wrong side of history. So he continues, or he, he concludes that uh, section of verse, in verse 20. So then you will know them by their fruits, as I said, and verse 20, 21, and this is probably, these three verses are, hands down, the most terrifying. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. What does he mean by that? It means they live their lives in accordance to the will of God. That is the evidence of conversion. And verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, kurios, kurios. The sovereign one, that's the Greek word there, the sovereign one. We know that you're we know that you're the king, we know that you're God, we know that you're the Savior. Did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. In other words, you live as though I never gave you law to obey. And that succinctly and clearly and concisely captures what we see today. Exactly what we see today. People claim the name of Christ and they are lawless. They live as though God never gave them a law to obey. But notice here what they say. They say, Lord, Lord, 
Did we not prophesy in your name? Notice what they are trusting in. Here's their argument to enter into heaven. Me. Me. My performance. They're saying, Lord, Lord, look at me. I did this. I did this. I prayed the prayer. I walked the aisle. The preacher told me I was a Christian. The preacher told me if I just write the date down in my Bible, I'm a Christian. The preacher told me if I just raise my hand while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I'm a Christian. Lord, I did it. Where's their trust not? In the one place it ought to be. Christ. See, our boast when we stand before the Lord Jesus is simply, you are all that I have for you. Your righteousness, your death on my behalf, your resurrection is all sufficient. If you won't save me, I'll be damned. I will be eternally lost. That's why I love that the words of the hymn, uh, which says, uh, Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, before I die. A true Christian understands the hopelessness of anything else. Nothing else will be sufficient. Nothing else will save. Nothing else will justify. The true Christian places all their trust on the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. He is their boast. He is their trust. He is their joy. He is their peace. He is their all in all. He is their righteousness, as Jeremiah 23, 6 says. He is their eternal life. A false Christian trusts in themselves. And I can say that for myself. When I was unconverted, that's exactly, I, I would have said the same thing. I would have said, Lord, I prayed prayer. I did it. I asked Jesus in my heart. What, what do you want me to do? And say, so actually, I didn't require you to do anything. Just fall on Christ. Just fall on Him and trust on Him. As Romans 10, 11 says, He who believes in Him will not be disappointed. Brother, we need to warn. We need to warn these people. It breaks my heart. I mean, just to think about Just think about that. I mean, to stand before Him on the day of judgment. And hear those words. That is the most terrifying. That is the most scary. Because like I said, they live their lives in, in this constant state of confidence in, in having eternal life. And then it's just smashed on the day of judgment. And the only way that these people's lives can be changed, the only way that a false convert can come and become a genuine convert, a genuine Christian, is by believing the gospel. As it always is. As it always is. Week in and week out. It's the same thing. Believe the gospel. It's, it's the same problem. It's not that the gospel itself wasn't sufficient. It's just they didn't believe it. You know, what's interesting is for so long, um, after, or uh, during my years of false conversion. And this is this is made below your mind, but this just shows how lost I was and how lost every believer or every other believer is. I actually had a passion for evangelism when I was unconverted. I know it's weird. In the midst of my partying and drinking and all this and horrible things, pornography, I would I would study evangelism. I thought it was so much fun to go and share the gospel with people. Um now my motives were wrong. My heart was totally not in it in the right way. I, I did it. Uh, my main intention was I, I just did it because I, it made me look good. Because I looked right. I was right. What I was saying was right. And uh, so what I would do is I would study online. I'd watch YouTube videos of preachers doing street evangelism. And I would learn how to show the gospel to people. And I did. I memorized the little thing. I memorized how to say, how to repeat off the gospel message. Talk about Jesus' death and his resurrection. Talk about repentance and faith. I could, I could tell you. But I had no idea what it meant. And I had no understanding of it. That's just, a, it, was a, it, blew, it, it blows my mind thinking about it. Like now, looking at the gospel, I'm thinking about what Jesus did for me, how, how glorious it is. And I understand it now, but it's like then I knew it. And I knew it inside and out. I mean, I've watched these videos over and over and over again. In fact, there was a YouTube channel where this particular evangelist would, would he had like probably 25 videos of him doing conversations with people. And he would present the gospel in every single one. I watched the entire thing. I mean, just all, all those 25 videos. There are probably more than that. I had it down pat. I even handed out tracts. I handed out probably maybe over 500 gospel tracts within a set period of time. I mean, I was 
I was passionate. I would have been like one of these people. I would have said, Lord, I, I memorized the gospel. I, I ended up tracks. And then he would have said, I never knew you. But praise God, praise God. Glory to God Almighty that he had, he had set me apart from, from conception, from the foundation of the world to be saved by his grace in Christ. It's truly precious sense of redemption. But it shows how lost someone can be. They can be even that close to truth and still be lost. The most dangerous position you can be in is when you're that close to truth but you're still not in it. And you're still believing a lie. That's, that is the most dangerous. That's where I was. Is that, I mean, I knew the truth. I could, I could spit it all off you. I could preach you a sermon. Uh, probably be pretty bad, but it would be a general gist of the gospel message. Until God gave me understanding. God gave me true faith in the gospel. And then I realized, wait a second. I have, and this, is, this came after I was converted. Sometime around that, around that, that period. I, I realized God is a holy God and a righteous God, as scripture says. As we saw, as we just uh, discussed earlier in Leviticus, how God is so righteous, He even He hates counterfeit worship, He hates false worship. He even <coughs> consumed those two men who offered up strange fire before Him in Leviticus 10. And His law reflects those His character. And we break that law, we transgress it, we, we lust, we commit, a, we commit adultery, we, we lie, we've stolen, etc., etc. And I realized because of that, that guilt... Is, that is why hell exists, because people go there because of their sin before God, their sin before the judge. And that I realize we have no hope. I have no hope. But praise be God that God sent forth, as Galatians 4, 4 says, the fullness of the times. God sent Christ to, to fulfill the law that we broke, to die on the cross, for the sins that we've committed to satisfy God's judgment and wrath to be stretched upon the tree. Three nails. A thrice-fold declaration of the triune God's love for humanity. And then He rose again from the grave on the third day and defeated death. And He commands all men everywhere to repent and believe the gospel. To turn from sin to turn from iniquity, to turn from rebellion, to turn from hypocrisy and believe. And all who believe, as brethren we have, will be forgiven of their sin because of Christ's atonement and wrapped in His righteousness. They'll be credited with having lived His life. Brethren, that is the glorious reality of the gospel. And that's ultimately why we bear fruit. Because of the glorious truth of it. That we've been redeemed. That God has clothed us in the righteous garments of His Son Jesus. Not just our sin has been forgiven, but we've been counted righteous in Christ. And we hope, not only hope, but we know heaven is awaiting. Glory is waiting for us. This is what false converts need to believe, truly, so that they will be saved, they will bear fruit, they will walk in obedience. So brethren, let us be vigilant. To keep a watchful eye for false converts in our lives as we encounter them. Family members, friends, co-workers. Even perhaps as hopefully we'll be doing soon. Corporate street evangelism as we go out together as a church. Encountering people. Warn them. You know, look at your life and ask them. Challenge them. What does scripture have to say concerning your life as a believer? Are you, are you living in obedience to that? Or are you walking in accordance to that? As Jesus himself said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love him, if you're converted, you'll keep his commandments, you'll obey him. But if not, you sure will not. You can't. And if you were possibly, perhaps I've described you, perhaps I've described you as a false convert, then I just challenge you simply, turn and live. Look to Christ and bear fruit unto God for the glory of God. Believe the gospel and God will save you. He will not despise a contrite and repentant heart. For the sacrifices of God are that. They are a contrite and a repentant heart. So in conclusion, we've seen that genuine Christians bear good fruit. False Christians now. That is the difference between true and false Christianity. Let's pray.
Father, seal these words upon our hearts and minds. Lord, may we go out this week living in accordance to your truth and bearing fruit for the kingdom of God. For we know that, that that is what we have been appointed to do, to walk in the good works which you have prepared before me. Father, I pray if anyone hears these words and is unconverted, Father, that you would convict them, cause them to believe the gospel of salvation, the gospel of grace. Lord, may this message, this offensive, this hard message, may it grind to dust the pride of man. And may it exalt your magnificent grace as it's revealed in Christ, Father. We praise you for your love. We praise you for your righteousness and your holiness. And Father, we even praise you that you are a just God who ultimately will render judgment upon the wicked. And for those of us who are in Christ, you render that judgment upon him instead of us. This is astounding. Praise your name, Lord God. Praise your name for your word, for your grace, for your gospel. And it is only because of the gospel that we enter into your presence and are able to worship you and able to pray and able to abide in you. And so we ask in the words of the, the Apostle Paul that you be glorified forever.